So yeah, first of all, I just I wanted to say sorry. I'm late, guys. I was uh, I was preparing dinner for my um, my legal Brazilian son Antonio, <laughs> you know, who's uh, <laughs> who's tw- twenty twenty eight years old. You know, at that age, they're such picky eaters. I was just saying to Shane, I was like, we shouldn't talk about this. <laughs> of course, we should. <laughs> we basically have to. My live-in son, Nestor. I don't know, man. I, I can't make heads or tails of it. There was a weird thing where earlier this week. Week in a uh, congressional committee hearing, Matt Gates was trying to somehow own the Democrats by uh, it was it, so basically it was Congressman Cedric Richmond who was talking and he was talking about police reform and they're talking about whatever milk toast bill the Democrats are doing. But he he was basically saying like you know uh, I care about this as a black man uh, you know my kids are black etc. And Matt Gates interrupted and was basically like. Like, are you assuming that none of us, that we all have white kids? Oh, wow. <laughs> and that happened right before the whole Nestor thing to give some context, to give some, only only a little bit of context. And there are still very, uh, there are many, many unanswered questions. Yeah, it's I, I shared it with the group DM earlier, but uh, you guys know Mark kept simple on, on Twitter. He had like his reply, yeah. his reply, it just was so funny to me. It was just like, okay. Okay, this isn't the only question I have, but why is this a screenshot? <laughs> I, don't yeah. know why, I don't know why, just the, the phrasing, of that, the particular phrasing of that question just cracked me up so much. But no, I was taking a little trip down memory lane um, uh, right before we started recording. I don't know if you guys remember, probably about a year ago now, maybe, I don't know if you were aware of this or not when it was going on, but um, probably best that I don't say who, but somebody from Twitter was um, was stalking Matt Gates around a, like a couple rallies, attempting to throw a milkshake at him. <laughs> Oh my god! Yes, and, um, I do remember that. Yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, and like it's so funny because I hadn't I hadn't seen this picture in a while, and in fact I was actually the one that discovered the picture. But like like there's a picture from like a local Florida newspaper or something of Matt Gates leaving one of his rallies, and you can see this guy like walking like right behind him, like with the milkshake in one hand and like with his cell phone <laughs> in the other hand, like recording them. And it's so funny because like obviously. Obviously, like, because he didn't do it. So, like, whatever, yeah. whatever, like, you know, you know, media person, whatever photographer took that picture and published that photo, they have no idea what they actually captured. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like I, I believe you can like. There's some photographs of like uh, John Hinckley like stalking like Reagan. Oh, no, like you can like, you can you can see him like there's pictures of him from like other rallies like you know right, previously yeah, yeah. and stuff. You can see him like in the crowd and like that's like that's what it is to me. It's like man. Like, I this... thought I thought you were gonna say like it's like Travis Bickle in the back. With the yeah, aviators exactly. and the and the mohawk. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> same, same kind of thing. Yeah, it's so good. One thing is for sure: this clout shit is wild. Yeah. Man. <laughs> I haven't I haven't said this publicly, but do you know do you know just the, bleep uh, bleep whatever he says following <laughs> this? <laughs> you know the character in Family Guy. I think it's Tom Tucker's son whose head is whose face yeah. is upside down yeah. on his head. Yeah, yeah, that is that is Tom. T- I mean, I don't know actually. That's, Go on, Dwight. That's what that's what Matt Getz looks like to me. Matt Getz looks to me as a lifelong hockey fan. He looks like a white dude who's had his face caved in at a bar <laughs> and needed extensive reconstructive surgery <laughs> to piece it back together and i'm saying this as someone who again as a hockey fan a long time hockey fan i've seen a fucked up face <laughs> a fucked up white dude's face yes we've we've heard about the the pear-shaped body style but have you considered the pear-shaped head style <laughs> very broad jawed man like it comes down like an hourglass. Seems like a lot of things are going pear shaped for Matt Gates right now, man. Oh, no. <laughs> There's the one, I think it's his, like, it's his official congressional photo or whatever, you know, like the portrait that they take. And he's just, he's, like, smiling, but his smiling, his, his smile's, like, turned down. And yes. It's like, it's like a forced <laughs> smile or something. It's so fucking weird. And there are other pictures of him where he's not doing that. So it's obvious just that one day, like, I don't know, it was, like, jaw lockdown or something. That it's optical really illusion funny. where it's, like, where you invert a head, but then you put the, like, the, you put the <laughs> eyes and nose and lips I didn't, and it makes sense I didn't know if I was looking around. at Matt Ketz or a Vaz <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. I'm not sure how this jives with uh, w- with what has just been said, but oh, I no. Matt Gates, uh, Gates, whatever. He reminds me of. Didn't someone uh, get facial reconstructive surgery, plastic surgery, to try to look like the Chad meme? Wow. I- <laughs> Jeez, I didn't know that. All right, I, I feel like look Shane. Shane would know the answer to that. Did that happen, Shane? I don't. I don't know. But uh, I article, thought you were just gonna say that was Matt Getz. There was an <laughs> article last year about a bunch of like uh, incel guys that were like getting facial reconstructive surgery to like oh my. to like appear what more the fuck? appear more. Chad. Let's see. Uh, a- adopted son uh, obviously has a plastic face. <laughs> Matt Getz, uh, you know, he's a he's a Breitbart guy. He's probably an incel. Jesus Christ. Think, Look at this think about fucking it. Think mug. about it. I don't know. I think he's the opposite of an incel. I think he's a fucking freak, man. Yeah, he's he's into some like <laughs> yeah. he's into some eyes wide shut yeah, shit. Yeah, that's the picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what a f- Fucking so- I mean, to be to be fair, what what affords us the ability to to make fun of this man is he's like a psycho conservative, like burgeoning fascist fucking nut job. Mm-hmm. Right. We're not talking about like your average third line hockey player who actually doesn't deserve to be made fun of for taking a, <laughs> taking a puck to the fucking taking a Zdeno Chara slap shot to the to the bridge or any beautiful uh, no, or any beautiful podcasters. None of our beautiful podcasters. <laughs> That's are, right. In our podcast, or, or listeners, or listeners. Although I will say, if listeners want to get plastic surgery to look more like me, you know, I won't say no. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> condoning it or giving it my blessing. I just. I would understand the urge. I want to get reconstructive surgery to look like face app smile Shano. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Joker fucking the thousand That's time it. thing. Yeah. I want to get reconstructive facial surgery to look like the uh, soprano smile from yes. Mike. <laughs> that Mike did. I love how when you do the face out smile thing, it just like it reaches that point where it just keeps adding teeth. And it's just yes, got like yeah, yeah. way too many teeth, and then it just like reaches the point where it just like sort of forgets what a human mouth is even supposed to look like. Well, it's <laughs> it's also weird now because it seems like for whatever reason this was like a big thing last year, and then suddenly in the last few days it's been flooding the timeline. I've seen yes. a lot of my people like yeah, weirdly weird. rediscovering it. And for me, the funniest thing to do with the gender swap thing is not just the first swap; is that you keep swapping them back and forth, and you keep doing that until the point where it no longer recognizes a face. And yeah. and I've done that a number of times to many of our esteemed friends some of them know about it some of them don't sometimes i do this in in the dark uh, hours of the night and if you do it long enough it just turns you into like an orc yeah yeah, it's like it totally distorts your face in this really weird like sort of genderless monster that 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 ends up coming out of it it's it's quite beautiful and again to be clear matt gets invited (laughs) around you know no he invited a white nationalist to go to the State of the Union. Chuck Johnson, who has a crowdfunding site that raises money for legal fees for the Daily Stormer, which is a white nationalist paper. Nazi, not just straight yeah, up little Nazi. Nazis. He, Nazi, he, yeah. he is he is an awful human, and I wish I had known he was gonna tweet about his uh, supposed adopted son, so I could have maybe done my research on Matt Getz, uh, Wow, <laughs> before today. <laughs> you never know. Did you see the video of? him uh, yes. at his parents house i think by the way this is the, the 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 cherry on top of this is he he's like i think he's recording some video to explain why he was the only person in the house of representatives like the 435 member house of representatives to vote against a bill on yes. human trafficking yes right <laughs> we're, like we're not talking about barbara lee's vote against the aumf here right this is like some something by the human trafficking that should pass by you unanimous consent probably except for matt Getz, and he was the only vote against it and he's he's talking about this on this um video at his parents house and he introduces uh his son his his supposed adopted son uh, uh, calling him the help oh this is the help nestor i saw right, that right, dude right. there's another Christ. there's another post i saw where he's um he's referring to him it's a photograph of of him and and nestor and then uh, another girl per, uh, a woman and um he was referring to them both as like students or interns so yes 
saw that as well. Not sure. So the um, thing about not sure what's going on there. Even it, even if Matt Getz is is telling the truth here, which I sincerely doubt it, a guy like him who gleefully spreads uh, like reactionary misinformation constantly, like if you're not gonna just start insinuating shit about this scumbag, you're unilaterally disarming, right? Like right, mm. right, right. Just just spread it like wildfire, you know? Like <laughs> spread it until uh <laughs> just cut out the middleman right there. Well, like I, like I, you know, like I said, like I said uh, just a little bit ago on Twitter, I, you know, this has been this this has been such a good day and I think that what we've been missing for so long is 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 large large sun content. This this there's been yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> Please uh, Meet my large adult son from yeah. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. It's been, remember Wyatt Coke? I was reminiscing about Wyatt Coke. It's been so long Yo. since um, yeah. since that. You know, that is an actual large adult son. Mm-hmm. You ever seen? You ever seen Kurt Eichenwald's old tweet that like literally um, Kung Fu Son? Dude, it could be a drill tweet. There's like even like you know like <laughs> there's like even spelling errors in it that like are reminiscent of a drill tweet. Yeah, his 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 large Kung Fu Son. <laughs> what? Oh, you've never seen? Oh that? yeah. Oh. Oh my god oh dwight hang on yeah. oh. <laughs> my s- my son is yeah. an international gold medalist black belt in kung fu <laughs> he's built like a marine he can take down an untrained guy two times his size oh this is just two two out of four is he gonna tweet that was a standalone tweet what's the two out of four yeah i don't i've never seen the rest of it yeah it's it's beautiful it's, it's a drill tweet it's a drill tweet <laughs> it's a drill tweet <laughs> oh my god log off please um kurt kurt I, kurt eichenwald speaking of which an, another one who's had some um rather strange unexplained relationships with young men yeah <laughs> oh yeah i uh i need to do my research on this one and uh be very careful about yeah, what we don't i'm need to get into it. before i get <laughs> and taken off uh itunes or whatever most of this is suspect regardless <laughs> speaking of suspect i was going through matt gates's uh personal financial disclosures today after he divulged to the world that he has an adopted cuban son and evidently he owns like five vacant lots <laughs> just normal where well uh, well i'll tell you where one of them is in <laughs> uh, wait, santa now, when i say where <laughs> yeah, no, I give the exact address the, the, the pfds do not have the exact address oh, okay it just says location santa rosa florida u.s uh location okaloosa florida u.s vacant lot cactus drive vacant lot magnolia heights he's got a vacant lot and uh, two vacant three vacant lots in santa rosa four excuse me four of his vacant lots are in santa rosa and uh uh, he's got one in Okaloosa. Good place to have a vacant there's, lot. There's nothing, nothing suspicious about. Look, uh, I, you know, I, we we've been getting a little bit of money through the Patreon. I've been looking to invest. I'm yeah, buying up. Got? I'm buying up vacant lots. You know, that's <laughs> it's a normal investment. It's the American dream. You buy look. an abandoned lot in the in the, the shady side of town and You'd like to diversify the <laughs> Eat the Rich portfolio. Products. Yeah, Eat the I, Rich I, owns several. Vacant Vacant lots. I think that it's more than likely that uh, this is probably just more uh, conventional scumbaggery in that Matt Gatz is probably um, a real estate speculator. Right, 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 right. But, yeah. but he would ask those questions about you. He would. One of his, uh, uh, another funny thing about his, uh, his, his PFD is he's got a liability to his father. Got a loan from daddy. Really? Don Getz. Does it say? I thought it was Stan Getz. Does it say for what? Uh, Vacant to buy more vacant lots. (laughs) To buy some vacant lots. That's weird. So he has an on the books loan from his father. Oh, yeah. That's very weird. I mean, I, I can't even fathom to relate or whatever. What's his name? Stan Getz? Uh, Don. Don, Don Getz. Getz. I mean, right. it's, it's funny because I think um, I think it came up, and it might be that the rules of the House are different than the rules of the federal judiciary, but it came up during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing, other than the fact that he's uh, probably tried to rape somebody, uh, is that... Allegedly. Uh, <laughs> pro- I said probably. I mean, that's... <laughs> 
just that <laughs> that is a matter of the record um anyway there was a whole discourse about is brett kavanaugh a, like a, a compulsive gambler does he have all these gambling debts that were paid for like you remember all the baseball there... tickets that never got explained either yeah he said it, but there was a theory which is that whatever it, it, it could have been done by the books and this is to say that the books are bad <laughs> but Basically, a family member could have paid off his debt and he wouldn't have needed to disclose it. Interesting. And yeah. And so, like, if you get a gift, if you get a gift from a, a, a family member, you don't have to disclose it. I mean, maybe Matt Getz is disclosing this because it's a loan and not a gift, and his dad is just like a dick, like he is, <laughs> and, and, won't, and won't just give money to his son or whatever. Or I don't know, like, whatever it is, like, getting a loan from, from your parents is pretty much like getting a gift from your parents anyway i'm, I'm um, sorry i i gotta bring this up about uh don gets here bring it up brother he was the founder of a hospice company in south florida uh, that provides you know palliative and, and and hospice care for terminally ill and, and elderly patients and check this in 2003 the united states filed a lawsuit against chemid corporation vitus hospice services and vitus healthcare corporation these are his companies for the submission of false claims from 2002 to 2013 the government complaint alleges that chemid and Vitus Hospice knowingly submitted or caused the submission of false claims to Medicare for crisis care services that were not necessary, not actually provided, or not performed in accordance with Medicare requirements. That, that's sorry, sorry to butt in here, but that's like a Florida tradition. I mean, Rick Scott. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that Rick Scott is personally tied to Medicare fraud too. He was the governor of Florida. He's now the uh, junior senator uh, from Florida, which is weird yeah. to think that technically Marco Rubio is a senior senator because you know he still looks like a boy and uh and it very much acts like one too um which by the way i don't mean to get too sidetracked here but since we're talking about things that came up on twitter today in the in the matt Getz stuff uh how about the excerpts from john bolton's book which show that uh president trump called juan guaido the beto o'rourke of venezuela <laughs> no fucking way yes no fucking way <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, the best thing about it, too, is that evidently Trump was like, he was of two minds of how to approach Venezuela, and, and, and he basically had two approaches. And I mean, this is according to John Bolton, so take it with a grain of salt. But Trump evidently either wanted to go like full scale military invasion of Venezuela, or he was also just praising Maduro. <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he would like vacillate between the two in meetings and be like, oh, these guys, yo, we should bond these guys. Up. Oh, you know, this Maduro, he's one tough cookie, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. And maybe, 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 we can do, maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm now just thinking of like a picture of, of Matt Getz with Juan Guaido saying, this is my adopted son <laughs> from Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> now when I was a young boy About the age of five My teachers taught me I could be the greatest man alive They told me I could change the world be whatever I wanted to be There was no one in the world like me Every one of us was so unique I'd not be an average man No sir, I'd be no average man So I had those big dreams Uh, how does this start? Welcome, Welcome back, back, everybody, to Eat the Rich. This is a show about our Take political again, economy. Take it again, because I said, oh, I said it at the same yeah, time. Yeah, but no, but they, but they wouldn't hear that. All right. Well, no, but I want to keep this Now you have in. to start it. No, we're just going to start it again. again, but everyone's going to hear this part of it. Oh, Welcome back, it. everybody, to Eat the Rich. This is a show about our political economy, late-stage capitalism, as well as the millionaires, billionaires, and multinational corporations hell-bent on staving off its death rattle. I'm Dwight. Today we have with us Shane. Hello! Wow, maxing out. Uh, we've got Chris. What's going on? And part of the two-man District Sentinel News Co-op covering federal policy, as well as the weekly news show Mo Means Morning TV. Fuck, on <laughs> Means TV. 
<laughs> After all that, you bungled yeah, We're it. leaving that in. <laughs> Sam Knight. Welcome Thank back, you. buddy. Hey, it's good to be back. Is this, what is this, appearance four? Appearance five? Three? Four? Three to four? Three. Uh, Four. I thought, I thought it was three. I think it's three. Sam joins John Goodman, Steve Martin, Alec Baldwin, and Tom Hanks <laughs> as the in the five episode club. <laughs> That's right. What a pleasure to have you back. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to uh, to be here with the ETR boys. Well, the, the the reason that we got here was that I believe that you had brought up something about uh, the gentleman that we're going to be talking about today, Phil Anschutz, saying like, you know, this would be a good topic to cover um in in which we'll talk about later a little bit of a beef including one of the subsidiaries journalists in the washington examiner that phil anschutz owns and upon that uh suggestion i talked to the boys and i was like why don't we have sam on to talk about this and here we are yeah so um I've lived in Washington uh, more or less my whole life, and Anschutz has put out a, a really shitty newspaper here called the Washington Examiner, and um, so this this feels very personal to me, and so I'm always happy to uh, to come talk shit about him because he he is he is a real you know he he he's not as rich as the Koch brothers. I don't think he's as um, as influential as them, but he he's a real creepy piece of shit. So. Yes. I'm glad I'm glad we get to uh to talk about him cuz he he does insofar as the influential billionaires uh right-wing billionaires go. For me he he, he kind of flies under the radar and more people should know about this guy. I'd never yeah. I'd never heard of him. He still is the 41st richest person in the world. Yeah, it's, he's uh, worth yeah. I think 11.5 billion from what yeah, I Yeah, uh, yeah, 12 billion, 11.5. Yeah. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of dough. And I it's think a lot of we... vacant lots. <laughs> <laughs> What's weird about this is that there it, his depravity goes in so many different directions. We don't I don't even have like a, a bullet point or structure for the show. I think we should just go and and just cover some of the insane shit that we found when doing some research on him. But I I guess it would be productive for us to start off with just a little bit of a background story about this psycho. And so I I'm going to read something here uh just a little bit about him and his background. He was a rich guy. He was a rich boy growing up. He oh was, yeah. He was born in Kansas in 1939. He was the grandson. This is actually interesting. He was the grandson of a German-speaking immigrant from Russia hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the son of a oil wildcatter. If, quick if... side note, something I found very funny. His mother's maiden name is Fister. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Which I... Uh... It's a very German... German I got a nice, I got a, I got a nice, uh, I got a nice chuckle out of that. Yeah. And in case anybody's not familiar, what oil wildcatting is basically is like literally just drilling a hole in the ground, hoping that oil comes out. It's got like a thirty percent success rate, and you know, if you if you hit oil, great, and if not, then you, I don't know, you declare bankruptcy for that LLC. So, yeah, some, some, some Daniel Daniel Plainview shit. Exactly, exactly. Very kind of old school way of doing. It. And I should I should mention as well about the uh, the the German and Russian history, the great-grandfather Christian Anschutz was one of the German farmers brought to Russia by Catherine the Great to increase the yield in the Volga River Valley. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then he went from the Volga River to Russell, Kansas. And many and many of his co you know, uh, national compatriots would also, you know, a hundred or so years later, also go to the Volga ra uh, River Valley and <laughs> find something very much different. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Millions of them. I, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but uh, I think the Koch patriarch, I, I believe he had some connection to actually Stalinist Russia, like to, to the Soviet Union under Stalin. Absolutely. And, ha and uh, you know, had some business there. And so here's another rich American family with ties in the Midwest that has gone to Russia uh, to make money. Like, that's not really that profound. But anyway, we'll, we'll probably just leave it in. Anyway, but no, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, he, the uh, the Koch father, made his money from communist, the communist Soviet Union by selling oil field services to them and helping them with their extra extraction programs. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, which is fucking hilarious because then they spent their entire 
entire career using the money that they made from communist Russia to, you know, to fight against communism in their own country. But anyway, back to this psycho. Um, it says at age 21, just as he was about to enter law school, he was forced to drop out of university to take over the family's business, which was close to bankruptcy because of his father's alcoholism and health problems. Um. He was never the same. What happened to the Kaiser? Um, within four years, the younger Anschutz had turned to the failing family business around, sold it for a substantial profit and started his own oil exploration fit company. He f made his first big strike as a wildcatter in 1968, but almost immediately disaster struck. And this is one of my favorite parts. The oil well blew out, causing a raging, uncontrolled fire. Anschutz tried to hire famed oil field firefighter Red Adair to douse it. Red Adair, th I, I, I looked into this. I highly recommend, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but look up Red Adair. He was this guy, he was from Houston, who made his entire career putting out oil fires that were raging. And he would basically do so. You can go on YouTube and look at this. They basically throw a bomb onto the fire. And the, the detonation, I think it, it was something called like the Monroe effect or something like that, creates a, a vacuum and stops all the air from being able to, to combust. And it puts out the fire instantaneously. That's kind of the idea. Uh, but a dare here would only work up front for cash, of which the overstretched Anschutz, still in his 20s, had none. But Anschutz did know that Universal Pictures was in production on a John Wayne movie called Hellfighters based on Red Adair's exploits. He negotiated a $100,000 fee for Universal to film the real raging fire on his property and used the $100,000 to hire Adair to put out the fire, which Universal also filmed, get his oil field back in business, and buy new drilling rights. And just for the record, just like environmentally, I was thinking about this, the time it would take from the fire to rage, and we're talking about like just a, a geyser of fire coming out of the earth, to then him think about it, talk to Red Adair, get the quote, then... <laughs> say i can't afford this <laughs> then think out of fucking nowhere i've got i'm going to call universal pictures in a, a, an industry in which i have no no exposure to negotiate with them have the film crew arrive then fly up red adair to go put the thing out like all so all of this hundred thousand dollars to the detriment of the environment and the earth anyway just just boggles my mind how much of a hagiography we hear when we hear this shit. But anyway, Einschutz, uh, it was a really German accent. Einschutz's <laughs> oil business grew aggressively in the 1970s, and he began acquiring large parcels of land, some of which he consolidated into the 9 million acre Einschutz Ranch in the, in the um, Utah-Wyoming border. A major oil discovery in the area in 1978, the largest in the U.S. since Alaska's Prudhoe Bay discovered in 1969, meant that Einschutz was able to sell a 50% interest in the oil and mineral rights on his ranch to mobile corp mobile corporation for uh 500 million dollars in 1982 by this time he had moved his base of operations to denver leveraging the the half a bill from um uh, from mobile Anschutz quickly became uh, the first billionaire in colorado history there's more that gets in kind of the the oil business part but let's uh let's let's move on from this for now i i i can't believe that i think the fire story is uh encapsulates him pretty Pretty neatly because as we'll talk about and as you already know because we've talked about the um, DC Examiner briefly but on shoots his empire is basically built on hydrocarbons and media and it seems like there was some cartoon light bulb that went illuminated over his head uh, when he was presented with this quandary and you know he realized the power of media and how it could help him be uh, an oil scumbag yes. so I don't know I, I do think it is a uh, like it's too it's too on the nose it's 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 another one of those things that like you, you can't really make up like I'm trying to imagine Phil Anschutz today saying that like regulations that prevent you know wild Wildcatters from exploding fucking oil wells is actually bad <laughs> because like there are just so many entrepreneurial opportunities that exist if if your entire oil field catches on fire so maybe maybe this would be a good time to foray into his media exploits and his time as an investor and distributor of and and uh producer of film 
Okay, so he he owns Walden Media, and it is a company which is, as in in his own Christian conservative way, Phil Anschutz uh, describes it, that these are supposed to be movies that are produced, quote, to be entertaining, but also to be life-affirming and to carry a moral message. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what he's really veiling there is he is producing movies that enhance his class interests. Mm-hmm. So you you had a point there about some of the films that he was. Oh yeah, that he had I mean done? if if you look at the stuff that they've put out, I mean a lot of it is like you know they do like co-productions with a lot of other companies, and a lot of it is generic, you know, sort of like a children's book adaptation styled movies like fucking um I don't know, like charlotte's web um i'm just looking at the list now giver uh you know books that you would uh, uh, as a child would read including the chronicles of narnia which is obviously funny because the other so- christian connection there but there is a one movie that uh that that stood out to me that and then it sort of made sense and sort of piecing it together is this movie waiting for superman which i don't know i don't know if uh other people have you know very familiar with this i remember when this movie came out it's from 2010 um so some of our younger listeners may may not have even seen it or whatever but it's like a documentary film and i i, remember... I used to get really mad about this this documentary online uh back in the day i i i, I don't mean to cut you off here Shane, no no but... go for it go for it <clears throat> As an older millennial, like the education reform movement used to be like this thing that the neoliberals were pushing really hard on, and like in the in the late um, in the late aughts, early early ha- early part of um, you know the 2010s, mm-hmm. and this is just, it's just so vacuous and so stupid, and I'm getting I'm getting fucking really angry just thinking about it. Uh, again, DC was the epicenter for a lot of, of course, this stuff. Yeah. Michelle Michelle Rhee was brought in as the uh, school chancellor to sort of sort of charter schoolify everything and 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 make it good and uh, it was a disaster and um bill gates also put a lot of money behind waiting for superman so i also want oh, to say no that shit, no shit. Fuck. yeah that makes sense but, but anyway uh please continue no i mean i i don't know like in you know in, in terms of getting too much in the details it's been so long since i like saw any bit of it i, I watched some clips of it when it had first come out and like you said sam you know that was like a very like early online yelling thing <laughs> kind oh yeah of, big, kind time. Of scene. big um, time because basically the premise if i if i remember correctly of the film is like it follows a bunch of like young people who are trying to get into a variety of charter schools and and they're like, they, you know, there are all these like different kind of elements of what they have to do in order to like, you know, achieve more. And I think that was like the premise of the title too. It was like waiting for Superman. The idea that like this would like create some kind of like, I don't know, you know, like th- this this situation would create like this like uniquely intelligent genius person. But the whole film is basically just an attack against the public education system. Yep. And I, I the the ending of it too is like I, I remember it being like anti teacher union Big and time. and and a few other i i I, i'm i'm I'm, again it's been like you know a a decade since i've seen it but the point here is that it's like this like completely propagandistic attack on public sector education and the you know whatever i mean films like this are produced a lot but the fact that it's was produced by this company and i think as you were saying dwight in terms of it lining up with like class interests or whatever right like we've talked about it on the show before how charter schools are essentially just a you know an anti-left anti-education scam that are designed around creating um, sort of enclaves of specialized education for the people who can afford it and you know everybody else can just go work at the mill when you're 12 years old or whatever. And with with our money, diverting taxpayer money to a private corporation. Exactly. It's just, it's a way of restructuring the finances of an already gutted and fucked up uh, public school sector into, you know, privileging again, those who already have that privilege via, you know, attained wealth or whatever. And so the fact that it's like you know it, it's it's done in, in alongside like this film is produced alongside all these other either just kind of like you know fairy tale movies for kids or these other things that are supposed to espouse these christian morals it just it's like and then in the middle of this is like an attack against teachers unions <laughs> like the, that's, uh, that's the, their priority the, if i'm not mistaken and i never actually saw the film mm. but the conceit of waiting for superman is basically that cba is collective bargaining agreements and they their, their language on the fact that teachers just can't be fired for no reason whatsoever that basically mm-hmm. there's no at will employment in um in these CBAs and that is somehow stopping like 
poor black kids in America from right, achieving right, their right, potential right. because they'll be a bad teacher and they can't be fired and ipso facto like you know systemic whatever etc and it's just so ridiculous mm-hmm. it's so obscene and I don't want to go off too on too much on a tangent here I feel like six times I said that today but hit him um you're in the right place like the U.S. public education system when you control for income is like the best in the world world or one of the best in the world and not that there's one u.s public education system obviously you every state has whatever but the point is is that in the united states public education works very well extraordinarily well in neighborhoods where people are rich or Mm -hmm. have money or not even rich like middle class or whatever and so the entire the the entire idea behind education reform is, is to fabricate this myth of like unions getting in the way of horatio alger shit Mm-hmm. <laughs> right and like right. capitalism isn't failing teachers unions are failing right exactly it, it, yeah. it is basically the message here and it's 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 so fucking backwards and fucked up and and just like deeply deeply fucking poisonous the p the the the, the ed reform people the you know you know <laughs> I know. I was just gonna say. Interestingly, uh, I, I I didn't look at this until just now. But the guy who directed that is this guy Davis Guggenheim. And before that, he directed an Inconvenient Truth. Really. And most recently, <laughs> check this out. Most recently, he directed a mini a documentary miniseries called Inside Bill's Brain: Decoding Bill Gates. Fuck. Oh man. Mm. Which is a close look that he did at uh, uh, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates. We should uh, we should we should watch that. Do an episode on it. Wow. So the, it comes full circle here. It, is this episode about Bill Gates or is it about <laughs> Bill Gates? Because I think we've I think we've unearthed a little uh, a little juicy nugget here about about BG. <laughs> that might be something to to look at to yeah to look at later. But again, I mean it like I mean vis a vis like the 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 films that you know that have come out by this company. I mean you can look at them. A lot of them are just like you know whatever. St- Stupid. Uh, uh, again, uh, movies for kids that uh, you know are probably Narnia. at best like innocuous, and at worst have some stupid veiled moral lesson in them. The lion is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've talked about it before in terms of like you know uh, the people of this immense wealth branching out into these things, not because these other sectors are like particularly profitable, but because they serve another uh, you know they they're another arm of the empire. They uh, they accomplish oh, yeah. something else, and in this case specifically with the aiming towards like we want to like make children's films i mean the other way to look at that is like we want to make sure that the next generation is brought up believing or ascribing to the values that we have and so we want to find you know clever interesting entertaining ways that appeal to children to do that another word for that is indoctrination and on that line i just want to notice one of the other things that um not in terms of films uh but uh in terms of books that the um uh that the the walden company is uh, media has put out there's this book series that I saw and there's like a long list I was looking through but um uh I'll, actually I'm just going to read this other one from the from the list of titles cuz it's just very funny to me um platypus police squad the frog who croaked um, no! so all co- all cops are bastards including the platypus no. cops I'm just going to say it now um but there's another one God. here called the billionaire's curse and when I saw that I was oh, like no. oh boy am I going to uh, do that white man's read, burden lloyd let me read <laughs> The, um, just from uh, Barnes and Nobles here, here's like the th- three sentence like plot summary. The Billionaire's Curse is like a, the first in like a new series of, of children's novels that are aimed at probably, you know, like ch- children, young adults, like that, you know, 10, 11, 12 kind of age. And the premise of this book, listen... <laughs> Um, Gerald Wilkins never considered himself a particularly exceptional 13-year-old, but that was before he inherited 20 billion pounds, a Caribbean oh. island, a yacht, and three estates from a mysterious relative he never knew. Oh, but that's not God. all, because as we discover, Gerald's great-aunt was murdered, and now it's up to Gerald to find out who did it. So basically, this is like Harry Potter, but the premise is, instead of finding out if you're a wizard, you wake up one day and find out you're super for rich when you're like 12 years old <laughs> and you have uh you know whatever little saint james island in the caribbean as well just running uh, next door to see your best friend and saying you'll never 
never believe what happened to me. I woke up this morning and I was an oligarch. <laughs> yeah, you're an oligarch, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, how much of that is is pre-planned? I mean, obviously the book is was written by some other guy, but it's the fact that like you know th- this company would publish that kind of thing or like look for this kind of thing. You know, the specific types of things that they would do. As you pointed out, Dwight, in one way or another, it's it all speaks to you know maybe to a certain extent a profit motive but really when you're producing films like this like there's not really like a huge profit margin that you're going to get out of it necessarily and so the 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 you know if 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 you were like a billionaire and you had the money to fucking invest in anything the things that you would invest in are again like hydrocarbons guns and diamonds like the things that always go up <laughs> right like you you're not going to invest in a fucking media company unless you have some weird ambition to do that or that combines with the sense of like you know I want to have um, an arm of the media. I want to have an arm of the press, which then leads to obviously the acquisition of the the uh, whatever the um, Washington Examiner. Shane. To corroborate exactly that point, I would like to direct us to one of the films that Walden Media produced, which is called Won't Back Down. And this was like, this had some serious cast to it. I'm, I'm going to read the, the names. Maggie Gyllenhaal, oh, yeah. Viola Davis, Holly Hunter, Oscar Isaac, Rosie Perez, Ving Rhames, Lance Reddick. And this is the premise. I'm going to read the premise. And firstly, on the this this came out in September of 2012, just in time for the academic calendar to start. I'm, I'm biting my tongue off. Oh, dude. I'm, I, again, I'm thinking about those early uh, Twitter meltdowns over yes. uh, the, the education reform movement. So, But anyway, please the plot, continue. The, the short plot reads as such. Two determined mothers, a car dealer slash bartender, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and a teacher, Viola Davis, look to transform their children's failing inner city school in Pittsburgh, facing a powerful and entrenched bureaucracy <laughs> and corruption from the teacher's union president, Holly Hunter, and the school's principal, Bill Nunn. They risk everything to make a difference in the education and future of their children. Mm -hmm. You know, the entrenched bureaucracy and powerful teachers unions. Yeah. Nothing says big business unions like teachers. And how much, and Shane, to that profit motive, the budget for this film was $19 million. Uh The box office return was $5.8 million. So they lost Mm -hmm. money, but to a factor of like three. Mm -hmm. So what was the point of this film? Was it to make money or was it to foist a narrative about teachers unions? And I actually read something about this about, do you guys, have you heard about the parent trigger legal maneuver? No. So, um, somewhat. Somewhat. So this is... I, so uh, they're trying to, like, push this narrative, I think, to push viewers towards this. And, and I'm just reading from Wikipedia here. It says, a parent trigger is a legal maneuver through which parents can change the administration of a poorly performing public school, most notably by transferring it into a charter school. Oh, uh, there you go. And check this. It gets even better. Just about the history of this. Parent trigger laws were first introduced by the Los Angeles Parents Union, founded in 2006 by Green Dot Public Schools, which is a charter school organization. There you go. There you go. I'm sorry. Anything that's called a parents union just reminds me of a cop union. Yeah, I was going to say. I, yeah. mean, I don't, don't want to go like like super Tumblr here and say that all parents are cops or whatever, but <laughs> it, it, does, it does sound like a little cop kind of vibe, you know? It actually says here, Green Dot, led by Steve Barr also conducted campaigns in Watts in California, Los Angeles, uh, using a pre-existing law for school transformation based on petitions from teachers to transform public schools into charter schools. Basically, this is just corporate infiltration into civic life to, you know, enrich themselves by diverting taxpayer dollars into charter schools. I, I couldn't believe this when I read this today. I was, I was fucking madder than I was at Matt Getz. You know, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, someone confronted Maggie Gyllenhaal about this later and was like how, like how could you do this movie mm-hmm. it's just awful fucking propaganda and she was like uh was it I didn't really know <laughs> Yes. I actually I remember that because the guy who did that I, I remember I think he he kidnapped her and he and he put her in a warehouse with a bunch of oil barrels <laughs> <laughs> and, then to, and then told her that he's gonna have to choose. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
I'm really quick, really quick. I wanted to say something uh, since we're just on the on the topic of, of charter schools before we move on. And I and I can't remember if um you know when we probably brought this up when uh, uh when we were talking about this on an on an earlier episode. But this is like an old right wing and often also used by like neoliberal trick, right? When it comes to like public programs and public uh you know welfare, right? Which is what you do is the first step, right? Is you take like a decently running public program, right? Say it's education, healthcare, housing, whatever. And then you systematically defund it, right? And that can either happen all at once or it happens over time. So something that's already working pretty well, right? You take away a little bit of its budget at a time. And so then in 10, 20 years later, right? That system is now failing. And then what you do is you point to that system and you see, see, public education doesn't work. See, public health care doesn't work. There are lines to go get operations. There's not, you know, the, the kids are, are not staying in the schools whatever it is and then you use that as your reasoning to do what your ultimate goal is is to t completely destroy whatever that public infrastructure was and this is an argument and and, and a kind of political uh, economic strategy that's used by you know uh, corporate groups uh, consistently, right? That's why they lobby to defund these things. Or that's why, like, when, you know, issues about, like, the deficit or whatever comes up, the first thing that's on the fucking chopping block, right? And, I mean, we've seen this also just in the wave of, um, you know, the recent, like, uh, uh, uprisings against the police and stuff across the country. A lot of these have been shared online, you know, like, municipal budgets and stuff. And you see, like, where do the budgets go in the fucking city? It's all to the cops. Like, the fucking schools yeah. and hospitals get fucking nothing. Exactly. So what you do is you, you just systemically attack that and then you can point to it and say, see, it doesn't work. It, it's not as good. Or, you know, and then that's when, and that's why, like, uh, th those are all the arguments that they'll trot out. And of course, it just, it, it makes no sense. If you fully fund these programs, they work just fine. In fact, most of them work great. That's what conservatives have tried to do with uh, our, our beloved postal service. Yes, the exactly. Postal service. Exactly. And they, they, they made the, po they passed a law in, in the George W. Bush era where they forced the postal service to fund its pensions, like, like seven and a half decades in advance and it's like the only uh federal agency i guess it's quasi federal agency or whatever that has to follow these rules and like ever since then you you see republicans in congress being like well uh have you have you looked at the numbers for the postal service that it's gotta go yeah 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 exactly exactly so if if you ever hear that line of attack about anything look into the history of a program look when it was funded because a lot of these things that you know are in existence now they were either well funded at one point or they've worked in other countries or whatever and you can see that happening both in the united states and across the board in other places too i mean there's a perfect example of what's happening with like the british yeah i was about to yeah. say that the nhs yep. right people point to the nhs now and they say oh you want health care like that there's lines around the block or whatever it's because they've fucking been defunding it for decades Sorry, let's get back to <laughs> Mr. <laughs> fucking Anschutz. Mr. Over wait, 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 wait. We, we since we just mentioned Maggie Gyllenhaal, I um, <laughs> whoa. I have to say no, no, no. I this is this is something else. I used to do catering, and one of the gigs, uh, one of the gigs I worked was at like a twenty-five million dollar house in D.C. and was like a fucking it was it was a fundraiser for I don't know just some like dumb liberal shit like oh we're gonna grow like gardens in, in <laughs> underserved areas or whatever, thinking that's going to actually do anything, except maybe invite gentrifiers. But anyway, the point <laughs> is is that Maggie Gyllenhaal was invited to speak at the event and also there uh, to whom I served a glass of white wine was uh, then current CIA director John Brennan. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, Jose Andres, the shithead DC chef who... Oh, Jesus. Uh, who always tries to be a human humanitarian but has like you know opposed every fucking dc council proposal to like improve working conditions for people in the restaurant industry but he acts like so that that's a whole other etr possible episode is jose andres i fucking hate that guy did he oppose the no tipping campaign in dc what was it proposition uh, pro uh, uh 77 initiative 77 right he uh basically it would have 
uh, ended the tipped wage system for restaurants, which in case you weren't aware, I'm sure most listeners of this show are aware that if you uh, work in a restaurant, you, you don't get the normal minimum wage. You get a tip minimum wage uh, in most cities and states. Right. And um, D.C., they proposed to end that via ballot initiative. It passed. It was repealed. But uh, one of the big opponents of it was Mr. Humanitarian Jose Andres. Unreal. And he also, a few years prior to that, was also against a paid leave bill before the city council but Unreal. whenever whenever there's any sort of humanitarian thing like he he rushes there with cameras in tow uh the national media fawn over this guy Love like him. people like people like melt down about how he should be um nominated for the nobel prize and shit and like he's just so disgusting he's fucking dick sam I'll, t- I'll tell you what you just what you just reminded me of speaking this another tangent but speaking of uh, of serving a drink to to john brennan i worked as a i worked as a valet uh at one time in richmond virginia and um uh i was working some kind of event at um it was something i'm not sure if it was at the governor's mansion or where it was it was some sort of uh i can't remember ex- exactly where it was but it was some sort of um you know political uh event and um one of the one of the people whose car i parked was disgraced former governor of Virginia, Bob McDonnell, um, and uh, whose, whose quarters I may or may not have stolen out of his uh, cup holder. We'll leave that vague. <laughs> I have one more uh, service industry related uh, anecdote Please. about another Richmond area uh, politico, which is at a, at, a, at a wedding in D.C. One of the guests was Eric Cantor. Oh, no. <laughs> That's my yeah, that's yeah and, that's that that's uh he's he's the congressman from my uh, home district from where I grew up from where my parents lived. Right the 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 uh former house majority leader yeah. who is upset uh by Dave Dave Brat who also has since lost <laughs> his seat in Congress. But yeah, it was it was a weird thing where I was serving him a drink and like we 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 did this like we there was this dynamic where when he stepped up to the bar like I had this look on my face that I knew who he was and then he had this look on his face that he knew that I knew who he was. <laughs> so the, the, the dynamic was actually kind of pleasant, you know, like insofar as customers, uh, he, he, he was whatever he, he wasn't, I, you know, he the, awful. The, the funny, the funniest, the funniest thing to me was like, you know, the moment of like, you know, driving former governor, the former Republican governor of Virginia's car, his personal vehicle into the parking garage and parking in it. I just like had this moment where I was like, if he had any idea who is in possession of his car right now, <laughs> like, God damn. Did you try if to he, fart? If he only knew. Did you try to rip a fart? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 so I, I want to get to the uh, to the Washington Examiner portion. I, there's just one thing that I have to just speed through here. That's I'll say it very simply in one sentence. He owns Coachella. His, <laughs> Phil Anschutz owns Coachella. Really? He owns all of Coachella. He owns Coachella. <laughs> and one of my, and, 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 I'm, just, and I'm, ima- I'm imagining him at Coachella in like a like a Native American headdress. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask a question. Influencer really quick. Phil Anschutz. Yeah, go ahead. What is Coachella? Oh, please. Some awful music. music festival. It's a music thing. So for those that know okay. what that listen to music, yeah, Coachella. It's just it's a weird like retro futuristic show in the is middle. Is it like of the... Burning Man? Yeah, but worse. Like okay. which is I would argue much. Burning Man is worse. I would argue. Is it Burning actually Man is worse? worse? I don't. I'm, I think I'm Burning not, Man. Is I don't worse. know much about music. I think Burning Man is way worse. Yeah, I guess you're right. At least there's music at Coachella. Yeah. It's also in a city, right? It's not like you don't need like $3,000 to $5,000 just to get yeah. there. Or Actually, there you go. That's why That's why you buy all the vacant lots. <laughs> no. So you can host Coachella. <laughs> but you know what what, what's interesting is that I think a lot of people that, that go to Coachella are, are would be um, kind of like sympathetic to socially liberal values. Sure. And uh, completely antithetical to that would be literally anything that Phil Anschutz stands for, who is famous famously anti-LGBTQ. Uh, he has donated a lot of money, which we'll, we can talk about later, to um, anti-LGBTQ causes. And I just found this to be... 
in response to kind of people understanding that Phil Anschutz actually owns this thing, the most neoliberal paragraph I've ever read in my life, which was from the <laughs> LA Weekly's Andy Herman, which says this. Uh, it says, back in January, LA, LA Weekly's Andy Herman advised festival goers to refrain from boycotting and attend the event. This weekend, Herman is, Herman's advice might serve as a reminder for some attendees of the power of positive protest. And, in, and this is the uh, paragraph here. From uh, Andy Herman. Instead of a boycott, I propose this. Go to Coachella, but speak out. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Make a donation to Freedom for All Americans in honor of Phil Anschutz. Find a pro-LGBTQ organization going to Coachella and offer them your time, money, and support. Write to your favorite artist and ask them to say something from the stage or cut their set short in protest. Yes, kill the workers for this. Wear a rainbow flag all weekend. An yeah, empty, symbolic gesture, sure. But if enough people do it, the media swarming all over Coachella will have to write about it. And negative press is far likelier to get under Anschutz's skin than any attempts yeah. at a boycott. Yes. Yeah, it's not like he owns his own newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don't harm him financially, which is yeah. the only thing. He couldn't give a right. shit. He just, that rem it reminds me of a uh, uh, right winger is buying like Keurigs to yes, smash. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Like buying exactly. Colin I'm... Kaepernick. I bought an original Colin Kaepernick jersey <laughs> and I'm going to burn it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going into Chick-fil-A wearing a rainbow flag. Unreal. That's right. <laughs> What a fucking farce. Oh, my oh God. Oh, God. You know, I, I just have to do, before we talk about the, the um, Washington Examiner, I have to just mention this, especially today in a week where we've had all these, like, you know, landmark Supreme Court decisions. Uh, this was from uh, 2017 from Salon. The title is Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch has close ties to conservative mega donor activist Phil Anschutz. Phil must have been pissed. <laughs> it says here, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. They know each other. Uh, this is when like the liberal media was melting down about like Merrick Garland and like, arguably the most qualified blah, 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 whatever. Phil Anschutz, whose business empire ranges from real estate to telecommunications to railroads and oil and gas, is first known to have been connected with Gorsuch in the early 2000s when Gorsuch represented both Anschutz and his companies as an outside cancel from the firm Kellogg Huber. Giving An given Anschutz's ownership of conservative publications like the Weekly Standard and the Washington Examiner, it is quite likely that he shares a sense of ideological kinship with Gorsuch, who's long been a conservative on the conservative end of the political spectrum. And this was wild to me. Although it's unclear whether Gorsuch and Anschultz, Anschutz are friends, they misspelled him. They said Anschultz, but it's Anschutz. Gorsuch has frequently spoken at Anschutz's lavish retreats at his 60 square mile Eagle's Nest Ranch. <laughs> Similarly, Gorsuch shares a limited liability company with two of Anschutz's lieutenants, oh. the Times Notes, with the three <laughs> <laughs> Three of them co-owning a 40-acre property in the Colorado mountains. I should note that um, the same day that uh, Gorsuch made the ruling, and it was a good ruling. I don't want to say it was was not a good ruling, but uh, the same day that the ruling came out in the uh, Bostock v. Georgia, the gay and trans rights case, uh, he also joined uh, the, a seven-justice majority to say uh, that a pipeline can go under the Appalachian Trail and. Jeez. Jesus. I think I think on the whole of that, Phil Anschutz uh, was was probably pleased about the um, the Appalachian Trail thing more than he was upset about the uh, gay and trans uh, rights one. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's talk about the, the Washington Examiner. So the Examiner was uh, founded in 2005 by Philip Anschutz uh, to establish a right wing publication in D.C. And this sort of uh, well, not sort of dovetails. This is directly related to uh, what, what we've been talking about or what Shane was talking about with his his media ventures, which is, you know, mm -hmm. he um, and, and Dwight as well. I didn't mean to erase Dwight. <laughs> But <laughs> this is in, ter in terms of his, I'm, I'm a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of his unprofitable, um, you know, like the won't back down film. 
Like, this is very much a money-losing venture. And, Mm -hmm. like, not only are newspapers, like, famously money-losing, but D.C., Washington, D.C., already had a right-wing paper. Like, it wasn't like he was just barging into the market and saying, like, oh, the Washington Post is is the only game in town and we're trying to to give a voice to right-wing people. Uh, No, the Washington Times has been here since the 80s. It was founded by the Reverend Sun Sun Myung Moon. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. is another person there should be an etr episode about um when you reach the six episode club yeah we'll get there <laughs> so, well, I, I i i i'm probably not the person to speak on uh the reverend moon but um i'm just saying he, he, he he's a pitch you know <laughs> <laughs> that's a good episode but anyway so basically the um the, the answer is is that you know obvious answer is that and anschutz founded the examiner to basically be his personal newsletter and to be mm. a lobbying vehicle and this is most evident when you read about the business model, uh, or at least how it first started out. He uh, he delivered the Washington Examiner for free in rich neighborhoods in the D.C. area. No shit. And, <laughs> yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. It was just a free tablet. It was free. Fuck. D- delivered for a, while, for a long time. Delivered to your door. Delivered to your door. So, um, and what's funny about this is like I have um, done reporting and writing and etc. about the 2008 financial collapse in Iceland and it reminded me of how there is a newspaper in Iceland called uh, Freda Bledid that was delivered to everyone's house free of charge uh, like the examiner and had um, very deep ties to some of the uh, center left uh, the the social democrats who were involved in some of the more grotesque neoliberal excesses of the boom years and so this is Jesus. this is like a classic influence peddling trick you buy a newspaper and you just fucking deliver it free of charge to everyone mm-hmm. and that's what Anschutz did except I'm sure you can tell there's there's one small problem uh, with this business model, which is uh, when you're trying to give something away for free to someone who doesn't want it, uh, it's not really a free gift. It becomes just a pile of shit on your fucking lawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, inevitably, like immediately after it was founded, littering complaints rolled in and people were trying <laughs> to call and get taken off the list and, and they couldn't get taken off the list until they started complaining to local officials <laughs> and the, the washington city paper uh our, our alt weekly here reported on this in in 2005 not at not long after the examiner's launch there were 14 uh 14 registered complaints with officials in arlington county which is in uh, northern virginia a woman named uh, jean briskin wrote to the examiner telling them quote stop delivery of the examiner to my home immediately i did not request it and do not want it at all ever <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't listen so she wrote back and said i do not want to clean up what i consider to be trash that you dump on me <laughs> stop stop emailing my wife the washington examiner <laughs> okay karen so uh well karen has a point here i, I know say. karen has a fucking point here. <laughs> anyway so another guy and 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 again this is like this is a, especially a problem if you're trying to target like you know dc influencer type is you're going to get people like this who are like pointing out this is actually litigation risk for you because a guy named Douglas Cruth wrote to the examiner saying he, he was he was mad about how like basically uh the examiner will give you away if you're out of town and they'll keep piling <laughs> newspapers yeah. in your driveway and that's like signaling to the entire fucking neighborhood that hey come rob this guy uh so a guy named douglas cruth wrote them saying i will make a point with law enforcement officials and my insurance company and ensure that they know that the dc examiner contributed to the issue hype hype hy- a hypothetical robbery is uh, also in his letter. And so the Washington City paper uh, summed it up like this, which is uh, Anschutz's big splash was, quote, the examiner's big splash to date has come from its very own business plan, one that laser targets certain rich, mostly white neighborhoods for home delivery, regardless of whether residents want it. <laughs> so unreal. Um, and, and to give a snapshot of of what the examiner, what what's in the pages of the examiner, there's there's a Huffington 
Washington Post article from 2009 that goes down like the cast of characters that was involved at the time. And, you know, some of these people have moved on, but at the end of the day, Anschutz still owns the examiner, right? Like the ethos is still the same. Uh, there was like one, po- there, there was a Politico article where someone was uh, interviewed and he said, uh, a, an ex staffer was like, look, he obviously like, this is to get conservative viewpoints out there. There's the, there's no other reason for this. Yeah. Right. So anyway, um, some of the people on the masthead in 2009 were uh, Bill Salmon, a former Washington Times staffer, author of several books praising George W. Bush. Tim Carney, former editor of Robert Novak's newsletter. Oh, man. Uh, which, yeah, Robert Novak's a name that if you remember the uh, Bush era. Oh, yeah. Uh, you Crossfire. remember that guy. Cri- Chris, you want to jump in real quick uh, on some uh, on some Robert Novak shit? <laughs> oh God, no! I just remember. Um, I mean, God, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. I remember watching I him. I used to watch Crossfire years. every day when I got home from school. But who was he? Was also the one, wasn't he? The one who who uh, leaked Valerie Plame's identity? Yeah, I think I think that really? was him. He he was involved in the Valerie Plame thing. Or it was it was leaked to him, and he published it. Yeah, that was his that was his column that yeah 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 set off the firestorm. Yeah. Holy shit! You're right. Yeah. So anyway, Jesus. Tim Carney was the former editor of Novak's newsletter, and he was onboarded at uh, The Examiner in 2009. Uh, another guy on staff was a guy named Michael Barone, who was a resident scholar at AEI, American Enterprise Institute. Jesus. That's a- Another banger from the from the Bush era. And uh, Mark Tapscott, who was a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And uh, so what these guys were doing was uh, just absolute garbage. Murderers and, row. And yeah, uh, in 2009, the examiner put out one uh, report saying, claiming that Acorn was getting like $4.19 billion from the stimulus bill. Oh my God. Which was not true. And that was shortly before. Before Acorn was killed by um, James O'Keefe and the, the liberal cowards who refused to defend it, uh, they published things, uh, a editorial that claimed, quote, every three percentage point gain in union membership would be accompanied by a one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate, uh, not noting that this came from a study founded by pro-management groups, anti-labor groups. Um, the term pro-management groups is insane to me. That, that was <laughs> So that was my own touch. Oh, okay. uh, I said okay. management. <laughs> it, it, right. in, in the copy, in the Huffington Post copy, it was anti-union. But I, I had to, because anti-union is pro-management. That's that's really we what it is. We should use it. Oh, that's that's good. That's a good term. So yeah, that that gives you a a, a sort of idea of, of of what the examiner was like. It it changed now. Um, I I don't know whether or not the littering complaints had an impact or whether or not Anschutz was just trying to cut costs. But in 2013, he. He uh, stopped the daily publications and uh, the examiner became a weekly. And this also confirms the thesis that this is just fucking Anschutz's personal newsletter yep. for, right, right, uh, right. for his own lobbying interests because the entire newsroom was fired. 87 people were laid off. Jesus um, Christ. Not that I really feel bad for them, quite frankly, because <laughs> if you work for the Washington Examiner, you're fucking low life to begin with. And you, you should probably... <laughs> Are you are you listening, Siraj? <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping. <laughs> Speaking of the newsroom for the Washington Examiner, one of our uh, hosts here yeah. has a bit of a relationship with one of them. Is that is that true? Uh, but that that is. But 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 before we uh, before we get there, there was just one more thing which I wanted to say, which is there was just um, the 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 Examiner parent company, Clarity Media Group, put out a uh, a press release, and uh, the language is is just beautiful and in their downsizing they say they the company wants to focus on quote political thought leadership uh, <laughs> also quote the target readership for the print weekly will be forty five thousand government public affairs advocacy academia and political professionals in washington dc and state capitals oh wow it, yeah exactly i mean he's like admitting it right here this is like this is my this is my newsletter this is daddy's newsletter uh <laughs> this is my lobbying wish list and if you want to if you want to get a uh, chocolate from from philip uh, you know, <laughs> to see see what's up. I, I did want to note one more thing uh, before we move on to Siraj, which is that it, this was mentioned earlier, uh, which is that Anschutz at one point bought the Weekly Standard from Rupert Murdoch. Right. Uh, he, he paid a million dollars for it. 
and then gutted he, it, right? He, in in two thousand and eight, yeah, and then ten years later in twenty eighteen, he he gutted it. He shut it down. So at least he's done one good thing, which uh, <laughs> he made Bill Crystal have an absolute fucking meltdown. And John Podhoritz, um, Podhoritz at one point complained that this is according to NPR. Podhoritz said the standard subscriber list may be incorporated into a soon to be launched magazine connected to the Washington Examiner. So in essence, it's being cannibalized. Literally, he said, that's capitalism, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what you want, Johnny? Isn't that what you want, j Pod? <laughs> Unreal. Anyway, uh, yeah. So Antrit's media scumbag did unintentionally did one good thing, <laughs> caused a uh, J Pod meltdown. I, they also, um, just in terms of uh, the other uh, minor feather in their whatever uh, media cap, they bought out a uh, Colorado, uh, a Colorado, a Denver, Colorado p- uh, media piece called uh, the uh, the Gazette. I think it was the 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 something Gazette, like the Denzer Gazette, and um, when Anschutz after they bought it, they made um, he made his son Christian Anschutz the new like head editor or one of the one of the editors on it. And so it's like it's a, you know it's a regional newspaper or whatever. I don't know many of the other details about it. This is my son Christian. Please be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> but like if you then uh, you know if you look up Christian Anschutz Gazette as I did in you know looking to this uh, episode most of the articles that I found were not articles about the acquisition of the the Gazette most of the articles were from the Gazette about how good of a guy Christian Anschutz <laughs> oh, is Oh stop <laughs> Are you serious? Uh, th- yeah, no. They're the one oh, I, fucking worm. You have to get a subscription to <laughs> to read a bunch of these, which I don't care enough to. But um, the one, the one they they bought it in 2012, and the one, the first one that comes up is uh is a, actually a Facebook post by by the <laughs> Gazette, and it says Christian Anschutz is renowned for his support of military causes. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> that was this year. This this uh, is apropos of nothing, but I just have to mention that the editor in chief, the former editor editor in chief of uh, the Weekly Standard, Stephen F. Hayes. There's something on his Wikipedia page that says in September 2014, Hayes's name was added to the Department of Homeland Security's terror watch list. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh. swallowed my own laughter after <laughs> receiving additional security <coughs> on several airline flights. Yeah, he's a terrorist. <coughs> was, was this like a mark of pride of his? Like, oh, look at Obama is trying to no. declare, a, <laughs> declare a free man a terrorist. Did I ever tell you guys that I'm pretty sure I'm on the terrorist watch list? Oh, God, don't tell me that, Oh, Jane, tell me, please. tell me. No, uh, you you I, make I, this I, sounds I, familiar, I, but I can't remember why. A story for a different time, I guess. Oh, <laughs> oh we'll, on, talk, we'll talk about it. Well, actually, we'll put this on the patreon which if you go to there you go that's, that's good that's good Eat marketing the rich, man. you know yeah I'll, I'll give a little insight into why old shano can't do international flights i'm anymore. shit man I, i'm willing to, i I'd, I'd give up five dollars a month to hear this story <laughs> i'm gonna have to pull out of my pull out of the worker co-op being associated and fraternizing with no known, known it's criminals. too late oh it's too late i should have uh, really been above board Jesus. when we signed all those documents right <laughs> but- <laughs> it's something we should disclose uh- <laughs> hey hey by the way yeah oh god shane why why is all of our patreon money being rerouted through zurich Hey. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> Putting in this, it, why is all the money going into uh, Sharia banking, into a, the, the first Tehran bank? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Shane, I noticed uh, you're routing the funds through uh, some sort of LLC in Dublin called uh, Tiochfed Arla. Oh, no. <laughs> LLC? What, what does that mean? Is that like, does that mean like, let's go have a pint? <laughs> Very specific thoughts about the crown. Next, next, next week's episode will be on the House of Windsor. <laughs> next week's episode, and I'll do it live. Next week's episode will be recording live from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. <laughs> Oh God! One thing I gotta we gotta talk about with Phil Anschutz is the pass it on campaign. Oh, 
What is this? Oh my god! Do you remember those weird? They, they would they, they were like PSAs that would come on. Oh yeah. For like forty five seconds, a minute, something like that. With these kind of like yeah. Uh, what's the what's the word that I'm thinking about? Um, it's like those stupid inspirational posters yeah, yeah, yeah. that you see yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, in the Sky Mall. It'd be it's like, like uh, no, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I remember that. The, the ones that always ended with something like. Uh, you know, like motivation, pass it on, or something like that, right? They're like some exactly. kind of buzzword. And, yeah, mm-hmm. I remember that. Exactly that. And it would teamwork, be... pass it on. Exactly. <laughs> and they're they're all over YouTube. In fact, I think they have their own YouTube page where they kind of like host these extremely sort of like early two thousands looking um, PSAs. And and they are produced specifically from the Foundation for Better Life, which is a five hundred one c three. Oh yeah. All of the funding comes expressly from the Anschutz Family Foundation. And you know the 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 tagline. The the purpose of the nonprofit is to quote promote good values and and it still exists to this day. I mean, it's like t- a twenty years old foundation at this point. I I went on their website today. It might not shock you to learn that there was not a mention of Black Lives Matter. They have been noticeably quiet about any current you know civil rights movements that are going on, which are quite prevalent. Doesn't seem like promoting good values. Uh, they don't tend to care about that sort of thing. No. Uh- uh, absolutely not. I mean, uh, I remember uh, one of their ads right after 9-11. It was this really creepy ad of like one of those post 9-11 rallies, uh, probably in D.C. with like a little girl, obviously too young to know what was really going on, but like waving an American flag. And it was like a photo of her and her just like, you know, clearly this is over my head, like child eyes. And they, they wanted to use that as like as as their literal poster child. And it was <laughs> Unity, pass it on. And it was so wow. fucking creepy. And I actually remember walking by walking by it on a bus uh, a bus station in like in 10th grade, you know, like I decided to get into like punk like a few months before 9-11. So I was like not impressed. <laughs> and, and so I, I spat on the sign and, uh, and and someone someone drove by me like in a car at the intersection, like turned and spat at me and then sped away. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> it was like it was insanely like as like you know i'm not saying what i did was like super badass or whatever nothing i'm particularly proud of but imagine being like the cowardly fucking uh jingoistic dipshit who like (laughs) who who spits at like some 15 year old and then peels off i mean those are the same guys that are coming up to black lives matter protesters you know on on street corners and haranguing them saying all lives matter and stuff and recording them and saying I'm going to call the cops on you and stuff like that. I imagine there's a perfect Venn diagram of them. I, I have two things to say about that. For, first of all, that to me, Sam, is like your, like we've talked about this before, sort of like poster origin story. That's your version <laughs> of the Chris's story where he like wrote I, I laughed when Dale Erdogan died <laughs> in high school, just like spitting on the thing and immediately getting spit on. And second of all, spit I just want They didn't spit on me, they, okay. they, but they they probably, I don't know, maybe they were too cowardly to actually spit, spit on at me. you. But but it's a perfect, it's still a perfect like encapsulation of like your eventual life on Twitter. <laughs> and and the second thing I want to point out is that moments ago, Chris <laughs> told a story. <laughs> Uh, on the show about stealing quarters from the former governor and he said it probably like he tried to create ambiguity to, for protection and then like two minutes later he just straight up posted on twitter what just now that he did it with no ambiguity <laughs> YOLO, man. Damn, I, I haven't been checking Chris's feed while we're recording. I probably oh, I always check it. Chris's feed while we're recording. Oh, I'm immediately retweeting that. <laughs> Oh, uh, what, Christopher. I, I, I think we should uh, throw things over to Chris here to talk about Siraj finally. But I, yeah, there was yeah. one more thing about uh, the FBL, the Foundation for a Better Life, uh, which I love, which is that if you go uh, look at its 990, its, its tax filings, and you see who's on the board, it's basically all of Anschutz's family. Fuck. Yeah. And yes. like, none of them are paid, to be fair. They're, comp- they're not getting compensated for this. But like this entire thing thing and it's and it's shitty you know like trying to quietly subvert or trying to quietly peddle right-wing values and um giving this message of like bo- 
bootstrapping or whatever. Like this entire project, it seems like he's trying to prove to his family that he earned his money, which he didn't, as we noted at the start of the episode. He fucking inherited an oil company from his fucking, Mm -hmm. you know, from his Prussian dad or his Hussar (laughs) father or whatever. Who's so, our father? Yeah. It's so, so good. The, the whole thing is, is it's it's just so pathetic and it's it's so frustrating thinking about how like what kind of tax benefit does Philip Anschutz get for giving money to a fucking foundation that all it does is wag its finger at you, you know? I mean the foundation for a better life, it's just it's vacuous nonsense and like again, like just like thinking about the fact that he gets some sort of tax benefit from it is enraging. There was also a there's a great copy from I I think it's called like philanthropy today or so, some bullshit Hell fucking yeah. philanthropy industry philanthropy industrial complex uh, trade publication which uh, was was touting the foundation for a better life thusly food banks charter schools and homeless shelters are a good way to help people uh, editors note not charter schools Mr. Anschutz notes but in the long run people grounded in solid values will be better situated to prosper on their own mm-hmm. <laughs> So he wow. literally, I, his his justification for this, I, I don't think he's dumb enough to actually believe this. I think this is just what he's telling people he Right, believes. right, right, of course. But that someone's going to see some inspiration, me- inspirational message, and, and their catchphrase is literally, pass it on. And therefore, they will find success. Like Philip Anschutz, who uh, totally attributes his success to inspirational messages, and not at all due to the fact that his father owned a fucking oil company. Exactly. So how do we how do we put this together? I mean, how do we make sense of the the existence of a guy for and for the record too, we didn't even talk about like to me what he looks like is like a kind of jarring to look at. He looks like um like a old melted Ricky Skaggs or something. I don't know. <laughs> Let me see here. This is just uh he looks like an actor. I can't quite place him. Matt Getz is what you're thinking of. No, he's not that dumb fucking looking. Um, um, what's his face? Uh, maybe I'm just thinking that because of his, uh, 2012 convention speech. Uh, Clint Eastwood? No. Who, no, wait, no, no. Who, he doesn't look like Clint Eastwood. Who did the 2012 convention speech? Eastwood you're no, talking when about? No, when Clint Eastwood yelled at yeah, the chair. Yeah, oh, the yeah, empty yeah. chair, yeah. Oh, <laughs> empty chair thing. <laughs> you, you no, what, oh, he Mr. looks Mr. like Christopher Walken. He looks like Christopher Walken. Yeah, I think you're right. I was gonna he, say, he looks a bit like Ed Begley Jr. to me. But yeah, I could, I could see that. He looks... Off. No, he looks like um, the guy that's played in Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm, who plays, he plays the doctor in Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he plays the library detective in Seinfeld. Oh, Bookman. Yes. Classic, classic character. What's that, what's that actor's name? I have no fucking idea. Uh, I got it right here. We should, we should at least give him the credit, because he's a fucking fantastic actor. I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, if you're listening, please <laughs> join the Patreon. Uh, Philip Baker Hall. <laughs> oh, he's great. Um, anyway, so uh, drawing the through line, I mean, what's what's the point of all this work that Phil Anschutz does? I mean, is he he's donated to a- hire Siraj, <laughs> <laughs> friend of the show and Chris fan Siraj. What's his last name? Hajmi. That's from. Yep. That's him. So this this is this is the genesis of this episode, right? Should should we <laughs> toss it over to to Chris now? <laughs> yeah, Chris, what happened here? I mean, there's nothing really to uh, to talk about. I mean, I've you know I've mentioned him on the show a couple times, and um, you know obviously on Twitter, but um, I don't know. I, I find his whole shtick um, unbearable and cringy, so I just decided it'd be fun to um, have beef with him, especially because his whole thing, like his whole shtick, is like calling people out and like being combative. Like that's his whole thing so then what's funny is that when i did it to him like all his fans like mobbed me <laughs> like, like, like 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 what i did was outrageous or something i don't know i just think it's funny that um he works at the washington examiner and he puts that in his bio like it's something to be proud of <laughs> It's really weird to me. It's funny because well, like, cause his whole his whole shtick is like, you know, he makes his like weekly list of what he calls people who deserve to have their phones taken away or like a bad tweet or like mm. a bad take or something. Because like I made his list. That's how I first came into contact with him. Like, this was just like back in, it was back maybe in February or March. It was like, I guess it was February. It was when one of the primaries was going on and it was like 
the tweet I did was very good. It was one of, I, I stand by it, goddammit. It was like, um, it was one of the ones where I said I was like working at the, um, you know, told the seniors at the nursing home I work at that the van's <laughs> broken down, so I can't, so I can't take them to the polling place. Like, that's 50 fewer votes for Biden. And, um, <laughs> and he like quote tweeted me with a little hand, you know, writing emoji. And I was like, what, what does this mean? Like, do you want an autograph? Like, like, I don't understand. Like, um, <laughs> But that was my introduction to him. And, um, yeah, I don't know. He's really, um, I mean, talk about, you know, beating a dead horse, just beating a joke into the ground. So it's not even very funny to begin with. It's like a one note fucking thing, but he's, I mean, he's, he's got a, he's pivoting to like, he's got a Patreon that he's trying to get money out of it. And he's like turning it into a podcast. And it's like, it's really funny, like how much he's trying to turn it into a thing, like into a meme. So who, who, ultimately who cares? I just think it's funny to fuck with him. It is, it is funny, <laughs> but it, it, it also, um, it also goes to show that like a talentless dipshit like Siraj basically has a job for life <laughs> because of his ideological right. leanings and because yeah. of a guy like Philip Anschutz. And it's again, not to get too off track, but like the idea uh, that there's like a cancel culture that targets people with like right wing ideas. It's like, no, these people are uncancelable because they yeah. have right wing ideas. Oh, <laughs> they have jobs for life. They're they're dumb yeah. as fuck. Uh, you know, they don't do any reporting. They don't do any, they don't offer anything good. They're just there to just sort of snicker and, and be filler in fucking Philip Anschutz's dumbass like newsletter. To bring it back around, right? Think about all of the attacks on the teachers union that we were talking about, right? And what what is the framing of the attacks on that, right? Is the idea that like, oh, these people can never lose their jobs. These people don't do their jobs well enough. They have an intellectual responsibility that they're not actually, you know, fulfilling. And and so because of that, we need to destroy, uh, you know, their collective bargaining rights. We need to destroy their entire like apparatus and everything. And it's like literally that's that's what this billionaire is able to do is is just fund these like just feckless morons that, that then like you like you were saying sam have a career for life like this guy's set for life you know and that's why chris like you were saying like that's why he has washington examiner in his fucking bio i'm sure he's happy as shit he gets a fucking job that he knows that he's gonna be able to parlay into one thing or another in this right-wing media circuit and you know even if he doesn't stay at that publication if something unfortunate were to happen to philip anschutz and all of his money i'm not saying specifically what but i'm just saying okay. if something were unfortunate to happen to it this guy <laughs> Knows if something unfortunate that. were to happen to Philip Anschutz, resident of Denver, Colorado. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Address vacant lot one two seven. Um, no, yeah, like I, 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 for me, I don't know. It was just some way, somehow, the way you were phrasing it just now, Sam. Like really clinch it together into me, where it's like there's this ridiculous, ideologically unjust attack against working people that is constructed, particularly vis-a-vis -vis unions and like the teachers' union stuff that's constructed in this manner of like here. Are these lazy no gooders who just take up space and they're not doing the job they're supposed to and meanwhile like the real people who don't do it like what does Suraj contribute nothing, nothing. <laughs> he does the little he makes like a meme where he makes himself Dr. Manhattan with the writing thing as his face Jesus and he gets into fights with the smirking chimp on Twitter, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's just so it's so infuriating that they, like this whole idea, too, that like uh, conservative voices don't have a space in the media or whatever. When it's like they, that is that's the dominant media. Like they have a job for life. They can go anywhere to do it. Like, I, you know, the next step for him is to do like a PragerU video mm -hmm. and then to work for fucking TPUSA or whatever, doing memes where it's all again, just the little writing hand emoji thing. It's an absurd premise and it's really really infuriating what's what's interesting to to me is is with with his um you know as like we said we've probably for a lot of people that are listening to this they haven't heard of phil anschutz before there's a reason for that is that he he tries to be quote anonymous and there's there's a a quote from him a rare quote from him that i i want to invoke here which is he says we have always seen anonymity as a high form of charitable giving and then he says yada 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 we don't want our name and things he says but by and large we think it's probably most effective to be quiet but i will contend that there is nothing quiet about 12 billion dollars 
just him yes. Um, yes. just him having that critical mass like a black hole just like with this enormous amount of gravity and mass around him and influence that allows him to try to sway uh, American life towards one uh, that is of his class interest. Uh, I'm just quietly torching like half of a Wyoming forest and then filming it and then building a career off of both <laughs> of those things. Yes, uh, but yes. you know, I, I I like to keep in the background. <laughs> it's true. I should I should I didn't look it up, but we should look up the um like see if there's any YouTube clips of the John Wayne film Hellfire to see if there's any clips of Phil Anschutz actually torching the earth. <laughs> For, so in, in summary, fuck Phil Anschutz. Uh, Sam, tell us about uh, District Sentinel. Tell us about Means Morning TV. What do you got going on? Uh, District Sentinel, you can hear our uh, podcasts over uh, on all the podcast channels, whatever, all that iTunes shit. We cover federal agencies and, and Congress and <clears throat> and the judiciary and wh- whatever really... Whatever news comes out of D.C. that day or we're trying to ferret around for something. Basically, the point is watchdoggy federal policy news uh, for a left wing audience. Uh, Also, with, you know, we try to spice it up a little. Otherwise, it'd just be really too dour. Means Morning News, our weekly morning news show on Means TV. We cover everything. We, you know, we we just try to be a good socialist uh, morning news show. And uh, it's good shit. And if you uh, want to watch it, you should subscribe to Means TV. And if you uh, don't have the money right now, you can still at least hear a podcast form of Means Morning News. We have a Libsyn page and we're putting out <clears throat> Means Morning News comes out Thursday, but we're putting out a podcast, the podcast version on Friday. Uh, so you can still check it out even if you if, if you don't have the money for a, a subscription right now. Solid. And- is, is, the, is the episode over? To the listener, I've been spent the last 15 minutes trying to just losing my shit, <laughs> trying to get reconnected <laughs> to the meeting here. You were <laughs> just about to thank Sam for coming on the podcast. So, <laughs> so frustrating, dude. Well, Sam, it's been lovely to have you once again. <laughs> it's been great. It's been great to be on. Uh, good times. Yeah, man. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. We really appreciate you joining. Anytime. That's very kind. You might cut this out, but I think um, you should uh, uh, shoot. F- wow! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! Go to your local gun store oh, if you're no, in a state no, no, where you can yeah, easily yeah, get yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, Jesus you can still, Christ. You can get, uh, I believe, bump stocks still available. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, find a bump stock at a, at a local uh, gun show. Oh my God. If you need a vacant lot to bury the no, body, no, look no. up Matt Gates' yeah. no, yeah. vacant no. lots in Florida. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> so get some motor oil. Uh, no, some some uh, highly alcoholic isopropyl. No, uh, a glass actually, bottle. Actually, the best way to acquire rag. the mm. best way to acquire a firearm oh, is going to be. That's going to be. The stay, cool, stay cool. Stay cool. Stay cool. Stay <laughs> cool. One of the, one of the least traceable. <laughs> oh my God! We can't use the any police. Of this. Might not even look for. Jesus Christ! You just yeah. find somebody with their sleeping slip. Oh. Just. Oh, Jesus, please. No. Please. All right, stay cool, folks. Yeah, stay cool, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Stay cool. A crowded future stings my eyes. I feel like time to exercise in a uniform with two eyes tried. Unlock my section of the sand. It's based off to the water's edge. I clamp a gas mask on my head On oh, my beach at night There's an abandoned light Another tanker's hit the rocks Abandoned to spill out its guts The sand is laced with sticky glass 
Fuck, I lost my connection again. God damn it. What a disaster. What a disaster. What a disaster. What a disaster.